Welcome to episode 77 of Tailboard Talk. Today I'm talking with Kurt. We're hanging out and we're talking about, uh, we're addressing questions that you guys have sent in. Question one about stretching. Do you do it before or after and how do you do it? Question two, we've been asked about our most hated nutritional fads for the fire service. So we're going to go over the ones we've encountered, the ones we do and don't like. Number three is uh, how do you appeal to firefighters and paramedics and let them know how important it is to be physically fit or at least healthy. How do you do that? And the fourth one is actually a reaction to a comment I received after the sunk cost fallacy episode. And Kurt and I have some pretty strong opinions about that. So check it out. Hope you enjoy it. And uh, let's get into it. Here comes the intro. Skip forward 30 seconds if you want to get right to the episode. This is the Tailboard Talk podcast, the best health, wellness, and lifestyle resource for the fire service. We're using stories, lessons, and tips from the front lines to give a realistic view of what the job can do to us and how we can make it out alive. I'm Chris Morella, a firefighter since 03, medic since 05, full-time since 08, and promoted to lieutenant in 20. I'm also a personal trainer and strength coach, and I'm here to give you the best information and host the best discussions to make us capable and durable both on the job and away from it. So grab a heater, steal some fancy creamer from first shift, and let's go chat. Or did you, anything else come to mind? I did not. <laughs> cool. Well, I got a couple. I got a couple written down right. here. We'll kind of get at this in case uh, Kate comes back anytime soon. You ready? Lightning round? Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. First one, and a nice easy starter for um, kind of a fundamental question. When do you use stretching? Before or after a workout? What do you think? Uh, if you're only going to do it once, you do it after. But there's nothing wrong with stretching way in the beginning of the workout before you start your warm up, or just stretching to stretch. But uh, if if stretching is part of your workout, you do it at the end. Because you're thinking of long, slow, steady, static stretching. Yeah, right? yeah, the sit and hold for thirty second type stuff. Yep, and then before you we use a movement prep type of thing and. Uh, like a short duration activation. So similar to stretching, but press into the end range of motion for like two to three seconds at max and then let off it and then do that eight to 10 times per movement, like per stretch and then move on to the next thing. So it does a much better job of warming up and prepping the muscle and priming the muscle compared to static stretching, which kind of slows down and um, puts the muscle to sleep for lack of a better word, right? It kind of activates those, those, uh, the spindles and whatnot to, to relax and start regenerating instead of preparing for movement. Um, do you remember the two different, the two different like uh, theories on stretching warm and stretching cold? Do you remember the difference between those two that were kind of debated for a little bit? I don't. So one of them was stretching warm is ineffective for increasing muscle length because when your muscles are warm, they're more elastic and you can stretch a, a warm rubber band. It's going to continuously return to that original shape, right? And then stretching cold, your muscles are more plastic. So it's like pushing your thumb through a jewel bag, like a plastic shopping bag, whereas you can stretch it and it's going to leave that stretched out length in there. It's less likely to rebound as quickly to that original length. And so people were stretching while warm to try to increase muscle length and that was determined to be relatively ineffective. And then there's a theory out there that if you stretch cold, maybe you can add some length on your muscle, but it's, it's going to be so negligible and so difficult to like actually determine that. I think that's pretty much just a theory, you know? Yeah. Um, I can't remember the last time I stretch stretched though, maybe, maybe like a week ago, I think my hip was, my one hip was really tight and I, I did a combination of the massage gun while stretching um, mm-hmm. but every time, every time I get like the knot, you know, that knot in your shoulder blade underneath your spine kind of, or next to your spine underneath your shoulder blade or like any kind of cramp or anything, the best thing I could, I've found to ever do is like a, a workout with intense movement to that direct muscle group. And it seems to do more good than anything. Yeah. And I think we've talked about it before that you said that strength training is the best stretching you can do. So, yeah, and a lot of times that if it's tight or seized up or crampy or whatever, um, 
activating it and telling it to do its job is going to be much more effective than just pulling on it, you know? And so like, if, if you get that back pinch, like that muscular knot underneath your shoulder blades, the only thing I've ever done that's really taken away is pull-ups and rows and uh, overhead presses. And the more you, you make it do its job instead of being seized up, the, the more it'll function and kind of, uh, it's almost like you're distracting it from the problem it's having. You know, you're, you're making it do something and it can't be cramped up if you're making it do its job. So that's my advice. Well, the thing is, is like, yeah, and it, nobody stretches enough proactively. Like nobody's like, Hey, I feel good. I think I'll go stretch. It's always like, wow, my hips are really sore. I think I'll stretch. And then you do pigeon pose pose for 60 seconds. You're like, that's good. Did it. <laughs> you know, it's like that, that 60 seconds is doing nothing, you know? Problem so uh, just identifying that that problem is painful right now, you know, but uh, no, I mean, the amount of stretching that people do is, is not going to solve the problem. So you may as well start moving it. Beauty. All right. Question two, a um, little more loaded question. I kind of adjusted it a little bit to what is the worst firefighter food fad that's gone through the uh, fire service? The worst fad. Um, I'm, I've always been a, a pretty against the, uh, no carb, whatever, you, whatever you're doing with it, whether it's keto or Adkins or whatever, the, whatever the carbs are bad fad is, uh, is my least favorite one. Yeah. Have you ever tried a limited carb? Like do you, to keep it below a hundred or to keep it, um, at a certain range or just kind of be mindful overall? Uh, I, I'm kind of a proponent of being mindful overall. Um, uh, I'm more total calories versus percentages. Um, there was a time where I did, uh, and this is probably going back 15 years ago or so when Mark Sisson came out with like the primal blueprint, which was basically like what you, what you said there, it was like keto, but limited carbs. Yeah. And, um, uh, it was it was good for weight loss in combination with other stuff, but I got pretty weak, uh, you know, in terms of performance based metrics, whether it was in the weight room or whether it was, you know, at training with firefighter skills. I, I lost a lot of um, endurance and power doing it. So um, I, I've gone back to, you know, just being eat like an idiot 20 percent of the time and yeah. try not to 80 percent of the time. Yeah. Um... Primal Blueprint. I think I have that. I think I can see it from here. I think it's on the shelf right across the room. That was one mm -hmm. of those books where it's like, man, all this stuff in its own context and in its own universe makes a lot of sense. And then you compare what the idealistic Mark Sisson workout is compared to Correct. what you're able to do. And you're like, yeah, I don't think so, pal. So if I can gain, yeah. if I can gain a couple cool recipes off this and a couple ideas that I can kind of scam and fit into my life, that's cool. But that was a pretty tough one to take uh, full boat. You know, that's a pretty impossible <laughs> task to, to live his lifestyle, eat his, eat during his windows and his methods and all that. But uh, good principles in that book, at least. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would have to say that. So you brought up inadvertently, you brought up the, if it fits your macros one, uh, just with the total calories. That's the first thing I thought of, which is hilarious. Like I remember having conversations with who at the time I thought was relatively educated in the fitness world about the differences in calories between an apple and a donut. You know, if it's a hundred calories, it's a hundred calories. So who cares? And I was like, what are you talking about? Like what, yeah. what are we, what universe are we living in right now? And, uh, so that was a goofy one. That one's not really taken the fire service by storm though. I think, I think the one that I've been the most vocal against is intermittent fasting. Um, yeah, because, I think it would work if we worked at a different department, but we're just too busy. And if you're, mm -hmm. if you're aiming for a 16 or 18 hour fast and you time it wrong, that can easily turn into a, a 30 hour fast where we work, you know, and, and then your window's closed and you're done for another day if you're that strict on it. So you're, you're going past the point of beneficial fasting in, and calorie reduction, which is really the goal of it into like depletion and not so much in that starvation mode thing that uh, was kind of pushed for a while, but you're just, you're calorie deficient at that point. So you're not going to have the energy to perform or be alert or make your brain work appropriately or the sugar to get to your brain to, to make decisions. So we've had a few guys that have tried that and uh, they like it. And then they come to work and it hopefully doesn't bite them. You know, it's kind of rolling the dice that you're, 
your 16 or 18 hour fast isn't going to turn into a, a 36 to 40 hour fast on accident. But I think that's the one I've been, been, uh, most against. So you, you're just, what would you consider a, a, not a good fad then we've talked about it before, obviously, but I guess we can just run through the 80, 20, um, blueprint for lack of a better word. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's it, just make good decisions. You know, it's like, uh, if you eat like an asshole, the results are going to be, be that, you know? Um, uh, but also like, I don't think like if, you know, it's someone's anniversary and guys are getting shakes that you should be like, no, nah, you can't I'm not right. doing that. You know, definitely don't be that um, person. It, it's a, it's a long marathon that you're running with, with a diet. And so like, you know, one, one thing here or there isn't going to break, you know, the scale. It's just, if you do that four times, five times a week, then it breaks the scale, you know? Um, but the 80, 20 is just, you, you try most of the time to make good decisions. And if, if you, you know, end up having one of those nights that it's, you know, you run four calls between eight and midnight and you want to come back and have a snack at one o'clock and just have a snack at one o'clock. If it makes you feel better, you know, it's like, right. um, it's such know, a, so that, that, that's basically it. Well, there's such a weird, um, not dichotomy, but there's such a weird phenomenon that happens with food of like, you know, everybody knows, and I'm giving people the benefit of the doubt here. Everybody knows what they quote unquote should and should not be eating. Right. Um, right. and so that obviously opens up the door to make it more than just a decision. It falls into your habits and your lifestyle. And it's much deeper than just making, like saying, just do better, you know? And I, I think that's pretty well, not advertised, but it's pretty well understood at this point that it's a much deeper issue than just browbeating people and shaming people into not making poor decisions. But we also don't need to pretend that it's rocket surgery. Like we don't need to pretend that we need to completely revamp and revolutionize the way we eat and d dive into these intricate systems of superfoods and ultra greens and all just, I mean, the best thing we can do is kind of scale back a little bit and simplify and almost take a reductionist uh, approach to it of like, if you're eating a bunch of bunch of junk, eat a little bit less junk and eat a little bit more of the more fundamental food groups that you know are out there. Like we all know the difference between broccoli and an Oreo, both vegan, I understand, but we all know there's a difference there. And we also know that which one serves what purpose most likely, you know, the Oreo carries a totally different set of uh, enjoyment and circumstances with it than broccoli does. We all know this stuff, uh, but we, we think that the only way to make ourselves a little bit better nutritionally is to do a juice cleanse or spend a bunch of money on a very specific tailored ultra regimented way to eat. It doesn't, doesn't take that much. And, uh, right. that, that, that falls right back in the 80, 20 thing. But for some reason we consider this food thing to be just impossible to crack the code on. And there's no code. It's just, it's just doing your best to be a little less bad. Well, and I think too, like it, exactly. And, and people, I think we've talked about this before with, with, with lifestyle is people think that they eat better than they do and less than they do. And they think that they work out more than they do. And it's really, you know, the opposite that we, that we know. And I think it's some of the stuff the same with diet. People are like, Oh, I'm, <laughs> you know, your superfood shake or your, you know, whatever your, you know, super high quality protein is that you have, but that, that doesn't matter if, if everything else is, is garbage, you know, between that doesn't make up for it, you know? And, um, just look down at your plate and it's like, if you have a decent quality protein and you have some fruits and vegetables on your plate and maybe a starch, then, and, and you do that most of the time, then you're going to be in good shape, you know, right. and then it might just be backing down portion sizes or something. But, uh, you know, if you look down and it's, you know, a giant thing of rice and, you know, whatever shitty protein that you're putting in it and, uh, you know, then you're munching on the tortilla chips next to it, then <laughs> it's probably going to be a different story. Yeah. Yeah. We all, yeah. It's, uh, I don't know. It's a, it's a strange, strange part of the world or strange part of our livelihoods that we encounter several times a day, but we still pretend like it's a completely foreign thing to us, you know? Um, well, the other thing is there's almost no enjoyment out of like eating well, you know, like when you go work out, like, so, you know, the two parts of this is, you know, we'll just look at working out diet is you, most of the time when you go work out, you get enjoyment out of it. You feel good. You feel like you've, progressed they've accomplished something that day but like if you eat well for the day like there's no enjoyment out of that you're just like great I, <laughs> you know yeah. you didn't feel good about 
eating it. There's no reward to it. You just ate well, you know, and uh, that that's sometimes a harder thing. And then especially as you get into like a deficit of like, you know, your your body your body does much better gaining weight than it does losing weight because you get into this like survival mode of like, hey, give me give me some nutrients here because I'm fighting here, you know, and that's not fun for anybody. So um, it just in, in that inherently diets. Not, diet itself is not fun, you know. Yeah, yeah. It takes a long, long time to see the payoff for that, and uh, even then, eating those cookies might be a little bit more. That emotional tie to eating those cookies now, compared to hopefully six months from now, I look a little bit different. It just doesn't stand a chance. There's just no. It's a completely lopsided equation. Right. Um, bummer. All right. So, third one's kind of a tough one. I don't know if there's a right answer to it. I'm sure there is, but we we don't know it. Um, how can you convince or appeal to firefighters and prove to them the importance of being physically fit or at least healthy? Um, <laughs> I don't, I'm not sure that well, like I said, I don't think there's a right answer to it. And I don't think that you can. I think that you can just be available for when the people who decide that that's right come to you for assistance and, and guidance on what they should do next. Um, but if, if somebody's, if you have to spend time convincing somebody, I think you're just talking to a wall at that point. You know, you have to, you know, make it about them and, and let them come to you. And when they do, then then you're available for them. And I think that's the exact right, that's the exact right answer because, um, that's the only way to do it. And then we've seen that from time to time. And I'll take it a step further is you have to wait for someone to get either hurt, like significantly injured or have a significant medical condition where they're almost forced to change to continue to keep working or because they've had a couple of stents placed or whatever, or they don't want gout again. You have to wait for those dire circumstances a lot of times to, um, again, not even convince people, but let people know like, okay, if you're ready to do this, then this is a good time to do it. And if you are actually motivated and committed to it, then I can help you. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I've turned away several people from the department we work at because they're, I asked them like, what are you looking for out of, um, a coach? Like, what are you looking for out of this training, out of joining, um, uh, my personal training thing, my remote thing, what are you looking for? And as soon as they say motivation, I'm like, well, I can't, can't really help you with that. Like if, if motivation is 2% of what you need and me sending a text message to you saying, Hey, work out today. If that's all you need, then I can do that. If you need me to do anything more than that, then this isn't going to work. And that's okay. It's just not, it's just being realistic. It's not going to work. I'm there to supply you with the tools for you to use, not force you to use them. So, uh, I think that's the exact right one. You can, you can appeal as much as you want and you can shout into the void as long as you want, but you got to wait for people to be ready. Mm -hmm. Um, and we have, we've seen that with, with people who've gotten significantly hurt that the trick is, and this is part of the training we just did is they'll be hurt and they'll have surgery or they'll have their whatever medical event. And then we'll get them to a point of close to where they were. And they're like, well, this is where I was and I was comfortable there. So I guess I'll just, I think I'm done. You know, I feel good. My shoulder isn't waking me up every night when I go to sleep. So I guess I can kind of ease off on my, my, uh, exercise and my diligence a little bit and, and that's one of the points we brought up in that training several times was that's when you need to, to hammer down. Like that's the most important part because you're feeling good. You're going to test it more. You're going to be less cognizant of whatever the injury was, uh, but it's likely not as strong as you think it is or actually as prepared as you think it is. So that's when you're more at risk to get in trouble. And uh, mm -hmm. that's kind of the cycle, right? That's the runner cycle of run, get yep. injured, go to therapy and rehab, rest, feel better, run and get injured again. And breaking that cycle is yep. tough, but it's all in the, uh, it's all in the subject, all in the client that, uh, has to decide they're ready for it. All right. So I have one more, um, topic to hit on. This was a, a comment that was sent to me after the, I think the, let me scroll back on it. I think it was the, um, I, I can't remember the name of the, the, uh, sunk cost fallacy one. Did you listen to that one? I didn't. Okay. So here, I'll give you the synopsis. So just a few ago, we did this thing on the sunk cost fallacy. And essentially what it is, is uh, you, you go to the movies and you buy your popcorn 
and uh, your drink and you're sitting down and 10 minutes in, you're like, this movie's terrible. And I don't want to, I'm not, I don't like it. This sucks. But then you say to yourself, well, I drove here and I spent the money for the ticket and I spent the money on the popcorn and we're already sitting down. So I might as well just sit through the next hour and a half. So that's the sunk cost fallacy. And it's, it's mm-hmm. been proven wrong every single time. Like any time that you are doing something out of obligation, either to like, quote unquote, get your money's worth or well, we're already here, we might as well. It's always been proven to be a false investment that your your time and your energy is better spent doing the thing you want to do or just leaving that situation. So it's a the fallacy of the cost you already sunk into it uh, being worth mm-hmm. it. So I got this message afterwards and said, this just happened to me recently uh, as to why I'm not going through medic school this year and why I won't get vaccinated. So here's two, <laughs> two different subjects coming at me quick, right? Mm-hmm. So there's a lot in here. I don't want to, we can kind of break it down. Um, and I said, well, you know, uh, medic school is good. It'll get your preference points. Vaccines are going to happen everywhere. And, uh, I wouldn't, I th- I would expect that to be a requirement for departments that are testing now. Like it's, it's tough to put a mandate in for people there, but if you're going for a job in the fire service, don't be surprised if they require, um, a COVID vaccine. So this person wrote back, the vaccine is not my biggest concern. If someone chooses to fire me because of not having it, that's their problem, not mine. I love this job, but it's been ruined for me a few times and kind of going off some of your podcast topics. I don't want to keep doing something that I won't be happy doing for 25 years or feel like I'm just sticking out to please other people. Maybe that'll change in time, blah, blah, blah. So I responded to a few things on there. What's your, what's your knee jerk just hearing that message? Um, the two the two main parts that I saw were vaccine is not my biggest concern. If someone chooses to fire me, fire me because of that, that's their problem, not mine. Obviously, this person doesn't want to get it. And then uh, I love this job, but it's been ruined for me a few times. I'm not sure if I want to keep doing it. Um, I mean, it sounds like your problem if you get fired that's exactly what i wrote that's exactly what i wrote i said it's absolutely your problem if you get fired yeah um i mean it's the job is the job you know and so it's like this place is is paying you and and they're paying you under these conditions and if one of their conditions is that you're vaccinated then you have to decide if that's worth seventy five thousand or fifty thousand or whatever that's going to be a year. And if that's not worth it to you, then that's your problem and not their problem. And, and there's going to be somebody next in line that's willing to take that for $50,000 a year. And there's going to be jobs out there that you can find that will pay you that money to, and they don't require that you get vaccinated. But um, yeah, to me, that sounds like a you problem and not a, not the place of employment's problem. Yeah. Um, Sorry, do you want to hit that one or do you want to move on to the next one? No, that's that's what I wrote. I said, uh, I, I said, um, yeah, so I answered the second part first, but I said also if someone fires you for any reason, it's definitely your problem more than theirs. There's the endless line of people that are willing to take your job. And that's the truth. Like I remember hearing when I was a part-timer, like you're not bigger than the job and uh, the fire service was around a lot longer than you. And not this was, these weren't like directed comments. This was just letting – letting us part-timers know like what we're getting into, you know? Um, and that's true. This, uh, this is a, a combination department this person's working at. So they have full-timers and part-timers. And uh, yeah, if you think that you not being there is going to like hamstring them in any way, besides them looking, besides them taking more time out of their schedule to replace you. I mean, I, I think that's just completely false. And, you know, I would expect most, most fire departments or cities at this point are going to require to change the aside from the vaccine the requirements are going to be continuously changing and you're going to continuously have to evaluate if the values and what that city how that city operates or that government operates is right for you and if it's not i mean that does go into the sunk cost fallacy of like then find somewhere else that's fine you know you you shouldn't torture yourself at a place that you hate because you've spent time getting there um totally understandable to leave but also understand that the thing you're uh, not happy with and leaving might be just the norm. And so then you have to make a bigger decision if this field is right for you. And again, that's your problem, not the fire service problem. Um, yeah. 
So yeah, let's hit the second part there. Do you need that? And that that was yeah. Hit me with that. Hit me with that one again. I love this job, but it's been ruined for me a few times, and I don't want to keep doing something that I won't be happy doing for twenty five plus years to feel like I'm sticking out to please other people. Yeah. So for me on that one, first of all, this job's really cool. Uh, <laughs> when you compare it to other things that are out there, and if you think that you've been in the fire service for a little bit of time and you're going to leave and go to a nine to five and be happy. Like you're, you're wrong. <laughs> like you're going to be miserable. Yeah. You're probably gonna be miserable, whatever job you go to. Yeah. Um, you know, I think sometimes you just got to step back, you know, and, and, and look at like the big picture of, of what you do and what you get to do. And then, um, ask yourself if that's, if that's worth giving up because you think you're going to be happier doing so, so, something else is going to make you happier. And if you think so, like, oh, by all means, go for it. But uh, I'd be hard pressed to think that there's, you know, a job that uh, gives you the diversity of, of your day, you know, and the ability to do some pretty cool stuff and get, you know, most places, you know, good benefits and in some places a pension, you know, pay you the rest of your life. Um, you know, <laughs> I challenge you to go back to a nine to five, you know, and have to work for a living and, and see if, see if that's more fun, you know, and more rewarding than, than, than what you're doing currently. You know, it's just the, the old grass isn't greener on the other side. You know, I think, man. So, so I had a similar answer. Um, but I looked more at, I, I kind of got defensive about this one because, it might just me being older and being in the fire service for a while, but I almost felt like who, who's this person with working part-time at this department who has a handful of years on condemning the entire fire service because of, of their surroundings, you know, and saying mm -hmm. like, yeah, I got a couple jerks I work with. So now I don't like the fire service. And I, so I kind of broke it down. I said, um, let me go back. Sometimes it can be pretty difficult to separate the job from the people in it. It's definitely a challenge to be in tough environments and not just think that the whole thing isn't worth it. The biggest thing that you said was the job was ruined for you. And I said, nobody can ruin it for you. You can ruin it for yourself because of other people. And I really do believe that. I mean, I reached out to another person that I know through Instagram and she was at, she worked in California. She still does. So she's living in California, working on, on the beach. Uh, that's where her department is. She lives in the mountains. Uh, when you look at it at face value, it's like, how can this be any better, right? Like, this is the coolest setup you could ever think of. And then you talk to her and she's like, well, I had these, uh, you know, there's X number of stations and this station, you know, I don't get along with really well and I'm trying to, you know, transfer to this station and this is the dynamics. And I'm like, this, that's where I work. Like you're talking about, it's the, it's the exact same thing of like the same different circus, same clowns or whatever, you know, she's describing yeah. people that she's met at both departments who she's either made friends with or clash with. I'm like, I got one of those and, uh, I got several of those guys. And so it just, it goes to show you, like, you're going to make, you're going to make your situation good or bad. You're going to decide what you want out of it. But that takes a lot of personal accountability to say, these people I'm working with or these people that I'm dealing with aren't my favorite, but that doesn't ruin the job for me. You know, you can make them ruin the job for you, but that's going to be a personal decision. If you really, really love this job enough, then nothing's going to be able to ruin it. And like you said, things will piss you off and, and set you back and make you feel stifled or frustrated, but it's not going to ruin it. And, uh, you know, to kind of go off what you're saying, if you think, if you think things piss you off enough to ruin the fire service for you, good luck in a business, man. Like good luck in an office where, yeah. where you got nothing but time and not the ability to move away from people that piss you off or get transferred away from them or work on a different day completely as them and never actually act, right. actually have to see them. Um, so yeah, that's kind of, I will that say, yeah. And I'll say too, and, and I feel like this, this happens at other departments too, but I, I think that there's kind of a, a career arc that happens where you you get in and you get on a department and you're you go to academy and you're super excited you've learned a lot of stuff all your calls are exciting that you go to because you've never done them before and maybe like your first like two or three years are like that like everything's cool then you start taking some classes and you learn some things and you try and maybe you try and bring them back to your department and they're just not ready to receive them for whatever reason 
and then then you like kind of bottom out and i feel like maybe like maybe like years like maybe four to five to like eight or nine you're like this place sucks no one listens to me you know like we do all the stupid things and then you then you just have a decision at that point of like being like stepping back and going all right maybe it's not really that bad or you just stay down there you know and at that point you know world needs plenty of bartenders and whatnot but like (laughs) I i think most people are able to step back and go you know what like this place it's pretty good here i got it pretty good and then hopefully you can come out of that bottom that you're in but as we know, some people just stay down there and then they make 20, 25 years out of it. But like, I think if, I don't know, do you, do you feel like that, 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 that arc kind of happens sometimes? I think it can. It depends on what, it depends on how important you think you are though. Like if you, yeah. if you are these classes and you come back and, and say, Hey, I learned this new ladder throw. Right. And, uh, you believe it's better than what the department standard is. And the department looks at it and goes, yeah, it's good. But you know, thanks but no thanks like this is still our standard that's your decision point of saying like well i presented it to them and they made a decision and you know i might still use it but i understand it's not gonna be the standard or you know how dare they not listen to me i have this this coveted information that can improve them and i think that that comes with just you know time and maturity of understanding that um just not that you're not that important but everybody's got a, a, a part of the puzzle to play. Right. And right. just because it's happening now and it's not happening now, or your idea got brushed aside now, doesn't mean that 10 or 15 years from now, it's not going to be extremely important to, to come back and play. And, uh, you know, we got a lot of, we got a lot of people that take the first no as a never and get their feelings hurt because of it. Instead of going like, well, that didn't work. Um, I wonder if I presented it, incorrectly or it wasn't clear enough or I didn't show the value of it. Um, so maybe I'll try again later. You know, we got a lot of guys that get their first no and they're like, well, this place sucks because they won't listen to me. And obviously you don't care about your guys because I'm one of the ground floor guys and I'm telling you this and you said, no, that's not the way it is, man. So, uh, I think that just comes with, with time. And I, I kind of had this conversation the other day with some guys about, um, I mean, it's a, it's a department specific topic, so I don't want to get too deep into it, but, we have people that want to be in leadership positions with less than seven years on. And uh, I said, I'm not in favor of it necessarily, depending on the position they want to take, because you just don't know how to operate in our universe with that few number of years on. And I gave several examples of guys that don't know and don't have the time on to see the scope of how things move and operate. The person that said no to your project now is probably going to be gone within 10 years. Like, even if they hate you and they tell you, you will never get anything succeeded in this department while I'm here, you know how long that's going to be. Like, that's not right. forever. You can look at them and be right. like, cool, I'll see you in eight years when you're not here, and then I'll get my thing done. So the longevity we have is, is uh, it can be damaging because it feels like forever sometimes, but it's also a tool because by the time you're in a position to make differences and changes and have some influence, you're going to be dealing with a completely different cast of characters. And... um that, but that's the only the only kind of way to get that perspective on it is to be around for a little bit longer and see things that that didn't go through. When Joe and I, so when when we when we started researching battery powered combi tools, right? Um, mm-hmm. There was almost no hesitation to it at all. We asked for we asked to go to classes on them. We asked to have the vendors in. We asked for overtime to go check out this stuff. They gave it to us, gave it to us, gave it to us. We gave a presentation on the ones we liked. They approved it. We bought four of them or whatever. Really no speed bumps in it. We got we got hate on by two or three guys who were like, I tried that idea 10 years ago and it didn't work. What's so special about you guys? I'm like, timing? Like, I don't know, dude. Like, yeah. I, don't, I don't know. Right. I don't know why you didn't get yours passed. I don't know what the situation was. I don't know if, who you pissed off or what why it didn't work, but it worked now. And thanks for thanks for having the idea 10 years ago. Now you got your thing. You have a decision to make. You can be happy it finally happened, or you can be pissed off that, you know, these guys got it done and I didn't and blah, blah, blah. And some guys went one way and some went the other way, but it's all going to be a personal decision how you're going to handle this stuff. But I mean, one thing you shouldn't do is uh, make a decision five years into your career that you're going to regret 15 years later. And um, it takes a long time. If you make those decisions, you actually do have to wait for all those people to leave. And that can be excruciating but 
you know, if you, if you have the maturity and the wherewithal to be a little more level-headed about it and understand that the role you play now isn't going to be the role you play forever, then, you know, that, things are dynamic, man. They're going to keep changing. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't know if that answered your question. I was long-winded. just kind of got some ideas, uh, but, but uh, yeah, I don't know. We'll see how much that added out. <laughs> we'll see how much of that was pertinent. Um, that's it, man. Those are the four things. Those are the four things to hit on. Anything else pop in your mind while we were talking? No, I don't think so. Beauty. All right, dude. Well, uh, let's see. Buy me a coffee button. Still up. It's been kind of dry recently, so we'll see if we can scam some coffee off people, and uh, maybe next time we'll be in person sharing some some nitro cold, cold brews and ice vanilla lattes. Sweet.